Welcome back to the news you missed in 2020 from every country in the world. If you haven't yet seen part 1, make sure you go and watch that first. Unless, of course, you only care about the small countries, because we'll start with one with a rather petite population of just 8.5 million. An 8-year-old boy who tried to use spirit money — fake bills used in China as spiritual offerings — at a grocery store in Switzerland didn't get Monopoly's go-to-jail card, but he did get a mugshot and now has a police record. The heavy-handed punishment for using counterfeit money surprised residents because of the boy's age and presumed naivete and caused some embarrassment for the country, which discussed the case openly in Parliament. Chevron's $4 billion acquisition of Texas-based Noble Energy was an American transaction, but was rooted in Israel. That's because Noble Energy has built a large natural gas business in and around Israeli waters, and the purchase essentially opens up the country to energy development, a nation that had remained virtually untouched to such activities in order to maintain political stability with Arab oil-producing countries. Not only does the deal unlock the potential for a brand new resource economy, but it demonstrates that the Persian Gulf may now be more accepting of Israeli business. Togo became the first country in Africa to eliminate sleeping sickness, a sometimes fatal parasitic infection transmitted by flies found primarily in rural areas in 36 African countries. Thanks to more than two decades of dedicated public health measures, the West African country eliminated the illness which causes fever, aches, and, most commonly, disrupts a person's sleep. The good news is that cases are also dropping throughout Africa, and the number of people dying has dropped 90% since the early 90s when the annual death toll reached a peak of 34,000. Some more good news out of Africa is that girls and young women who are pregnant in Sierra Leone are no longer banned from attending school. Previously, once pregnant, young women were not allowed to finish school or take their exams, but this decision is a victory for feminism in the country and will allow tens of thousands of young women to potentially complete their education and provide them with more opportunity in life. The crater of a meteorite that hit Earth 800,000 years ago, blasting glass particles known as tektites to over 10% of the planet, has gone unfound until now. Researchers think they have located the impact crater, stretching 11 miles or 17 kilometers long by 8 miles or 13 kilometers wide and filled with about 300 feet or 90 meters of rock, on a plateau in Laos. Though a crater like this should have presented itself through erosion over eons, this elusive hole was covered by more than 1,000 feet or 300 meters of lava flow and was only discovered on a hillside after it was carved out to pave a road. Brazilian World Cup football star Ronaldinho spent the past six months in a Paraguayan jail and house arrest for entering the country in March on an illegal passport. The star player spent more than a month behind bars and was then transported to a luxury hotel and held there for another four months while his legal troubles were sorted out between the governments. He says he didn't know the passport was fake. During the latter part, he reportedly had parties and sang karaoke, leading people to wonder if prison is really that bad. Speaking of fake passports and punishment, Raya, a three-month-old chihuahua, was facing euthanasia for traveling from her home country of Bulgaria to Norway, where she'd been adopted, on a falsified passport until action star Jean-Claude Van Damme stepped in, and you can't make this stuff up. Bulgaria initially refused to take the dog back until Van Damme took to social media and the country capitulated, eventually repatriating her and putting her up for adoption again. Remember that story about Israel, natural gas, and the Mediterranean Sea? We're back to it, but this time with Lebanon involved. The two countries started mediation for the first time in 30 years over part of the sea because of their dual interest in energy development. Both say that a 330 square mile, 850 square kilometer area of the sea is part of their exclusive economic zone. The two have been essentially at a standstill for decades, and even though they had to communicate through mediators from the United States, their meeting marked a historic moment. More mediation in the Middle East actually took place in the United Nations in Geneva, but it led to a ceasefire between the two main warring factions in Africa's Libya. The two sides have been engaged in a bloody battle for years, and this newest peace attempt brings some hope to both the country and to nearby nations that have previously tried to intervene, such as Russia and Turkey. As Nicaragua continues to develop its natural resources, reports show that it may be doing it at the cost of indigenous people's lives. The government is actively promoting illegal land grabs for timber and mining companies, and there have been reports that more than 40 native people have been killed, though the police refuse to investigate. 
It's all the more complicated by the fact that President Daniel Ortega has family ties to one of the most active timber companies working in the protected area. Up the coast, Guatemala offered El Salvador the opportunity to build a port on its lands and waters, giving Atlantic Ocean access to El Salvador, whose coastline is only on the Pacific. In its initial phases, the port will likely be constructed through a private-public partnership and infrastructure, such as hotels and warehouses, would be built around the port as well, bringing a significant El Salvadorian presence to its neighboring country. Alright, try to keep up with this one. In Kyrgyzstan, Central Asia's only democracy, the president resigned after a week in hiding following a tumultuous election. A few hours before his announcement, President Junbakov said he would not step down amid the disputed election, but then he did and it left some wondering if his quick about-face was triggered by threats of violence from a criminal-backed group. The new leader is a former kidnapper who was sprung from jail by anti-government protesters at the same time as Junbakov's resignation, raising many eyebrows. Nearby, the president of Turkmenistan is widely known for his obsession with a breed of dog called the Alibi. So it didn't come as a surprise that he erected a 19-foot, 6-meter gold statue of the shepherd-like canine in a traffic circle in the country's capital. Turkmenistan is also known to have one of the world's more repressive governments and doesn't even allow human rights organizations into the country. That creates a definite disconnect in terms of humanizing animals, but treating humans inhumanely. Investors and entrepreneurs have keyed in on a new use for Australia's desolate and unforgiving outback. Turn it into a solar farm large enough to power the country of Singapore. Sun Cable has announced a $90 billion, 10 gigawatt, 30,000 acre solar farm that will send about two thirds of the energy it produces north through undersea high voltage cables. If all goes right, the lights of Singapore could be solar powered by 2027. In another part of the global movement to cleaner energy, Denmark, the European Union's largest oil producer, announced it would end all oil and gas exploration in the North Sea as part of its commitment to phase out fossil fuel extraction by 2050. Its existing 55 platforms, spread across 20 oil and gas fields, will continue operations, but the decision to stop looking for more sends a powerful message to the world about the future of energy and this country's goals to be a green leader. Some of the world may be saying goodbye to fossil fuels, but an animal that oddly turns out to like gas-powered vehicles, or at least their sounds, is a monkey. A zoo in Finland gave their white-faced sake monkeys a choice between the sounds of traffic, the jungle, zen, or dance music, and the primates overwhelmingly preferred honking cars and screeching tires over the mimicry of their natural habitats. When Slovakian President Zuzana Kaputova learned that Chinese telecom giant Huawei was the sponsor for a defense conference at which she was slated to speak, she quickly pressed end call and cancelled her talk. She cited security risks, along with following her basic principles, since Huawei has been accused of foreign interference. Huawei eventually backed out of the conference and Kaputova ended up taking the stage, but the message was heard loud and clear. The World Wildlife Foundation has been working for more than a decade to set up a national park and nature reserve in the Republic of the Congo, however, this year, the European Union pulled their funding upon reports that the anti-poaching guards patrolling the proposed park have been engaging in physical violence against the indigenous people of the area and are restricting them from moving around on their own land. The World Wildlife Foundation's application for EU funding specifically stated that the indigenous people of the area were for the project. But given that that either no longer or was never true, it's unclear whether this project will move forward. Only three countries still allow commercial whaling, and Norway is one of them. Typically, the Scandinavian country sends most of its whale meat to Japan, where demand is high, but Norwegians are opting to consume more of the meat for the first time in years, which is probably due to the growing movement against traditionally processed meat in favor of locally sourced products like the mink whales they hunt in their own waters. Close your eyes if you don't want to see something bizarre. It's the wrinkle-faced bat native to Costa Rica. But of course, what one sees as ugly, others find… sexy? New research this year found that these elusive jungle dwellers mate in an interesting way. The males congregate in big groups, perform a routine, and fold some of the extra skin around their face up like a neck gaiter to seduce the females. And it seems to work. 
Three Palestinian peace activists who held a Zoom call with Israelis that included more than 200 participants and viewers were charged with, quote, weakening revolutionary spirit. Their goal was part of a bridge-building initiative called Skype with Your Enemy, but according to Palestinian officials, communication with Israel is considered a, quote, normalization activity and punishable. The three could face years in prison and hard labor sentences. The Arab world's longest-serving ruler, the Sultan of Oman, died this year at the age of 79. Since he had no children, his cousin was chosen to replace him, ending years of speculation on which of the more than 80 potential successors would gain the spot. Upon his passing, the Sultan was recognized for his steadfast diplomatic reign by other world leaders. This is a seemingly peaceful story about a leadership change amid a flurry of headlines this year that were quite the opposite. It's easier to get to Liberia from France, as well as other Western destinations, now that Air France resumed its flight from Paris to Monrovia after a nine-year hiatus. The direct flight debuted on an Airbus A350, which landed at a newly refurbished Robert International Airport in Liberia. Officials boasted about the newly improved connections between the United States, United Kingdom, India, and China with the return of this flight, and, naturally, the strengthened ties between Liberia and France. When visitors to the North Pole buried a time capsule there in 2018, they thought it would be 40 years until it was discovered, but because of climate change and the fast-melting Arctic, the artifacts were found much sooner. They washed up on the shores of Ireland this year, some 2,300 miles or 3,700 kilometers away. That's obviously another bad sign for the Arctic, which some scientists say will be ice-free by the summer of 2035. Last year, a volcano on New Zealand's White Island erupted and killed 22 people, including children and seniors, who were there with tour groups. Now, 13 parties have been charged in their deaths, with lawsuits claiming negligence for allowing people to visit the site of an active volcano. A family owns the island, and tours were run by a small group of operators, but the island has been closed to visitors ever since. A Sudanese militia leader who had been on the run for 13 years was arrested in a remote corner of the Central African Republic near the border with Sudan, which is where he allegedly carried out crimes against humanity, including mass campaigns of murder, rape, and looting in the early 2000s, which partially contributed to a humanitarian crisis in which 300,000 people were killed and 2.7 million were driven from their homes. His arrest and subsequent trial at The Hague will potentially bring justice to many who have suffered in Darfur. For several months, Mauritania banned Senegal from fishing in its waters because of illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, which they say cost their country up to $300 million in lost revenue. Now, under the new agreement, Senegal will pay Mauritania for the actual fish it catches, which means no more punitive fines for the country instead. It seems like a win-win for the two West African countries, and demonstrates some progress towards countries all happily sharing the same pond. In 2016, the Panama Papers exposed how some of the world's most prominent politicians, business leaders, and celebrities set up offshore bank accounts to conceal their wealth and avoid taxes in the Central American country. So, of course, Netflix made a movie about it. But now, the law firm behind the 11.5 million documents is not happy about their portrayal as, quote, ruthless, uncaring, and unethical lawyers, so they're doing the most lawyer thing possible and suing Netflix. Jürgen Mosak and Ramon Fonseca are claiming defamation and asked Netflix to cease streaming The Laundromat, though it's already been screened to crowds at European film festivals. Readers, writers, and free speech advocates are rejoicing now that officials in Kuwait disbanded a committee that banned more than 5,000 books over seven years. The country's Ministry of Information will no longer have the control to censor titles like Victor Hugo's The Hunchback of Notre Dame and 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. But besides banning book imports, the committee also had a say over every title that was published in the country. Now they don't, and that means the words should flow more freely. Here's a tip. If you're German but wanted in the United States for building software that tricks automobile emissions inspectors, then don't cross from Germany, where you're protected, into Croatia, where you're not. Apparently, former Volkswagen executive Alex Eiser didn't get the memo that only his native country doesn't extradite its own citizens. He was arrested when crossing the border in June and will likely be charged in the United States since America and Croatia signed an extradition treaty last year. He's at the center of the emissions scandal in which the German auto manufacturer tried to evade U.S. Clean Air Act laws 
by tricking the system, and his arrest shows that the United States isn't finished with this car chase yet. Moldova is veering away from its Putin-leaning ways, at least temporarily, with its election of Maya Sandu, a pro-Western, Harvard-educated former prime minister and its ouster of incumbent pro-Russian president Igor Dodon. Besides favoring European ties, Sandu is also the country's first woman president. She ran on an anti-corruption platform and championed embracing the country's Romanian roots, as 75 of the country speaks Romanian, over its ties to Russia. Tiny Moldova is sandwiched between Ukraine and Romania, which have also leaned more Russian in recent years, and the results demonstrate this region's increased shift away from Russia. If you're tired of hearing about Georgia, the US state, you can opt to move to the Eastern European country of the same name to escape the 24-7 news. The nation recently announced a visa-free entry program called Remotely from Georgia that grants year-long stays to nationals from 95 countries. There are some caveats. Transplants must earn at least $2,000 per month and have health insurance, meaning the country is looking for a certain type of more permanent visitor, one that has money and can contribute to its faltering economy. The European Union is being held accountable for the way it funds projects in Africa thanks to a group of Eritreans in the Netherlands. They allege that the EU is paying for forced labor by funding heavy construction equipment to open and pave a road that connects the Ethiopia-Eritrea border with the Eritrean port of Massawa. That equipment is apparently being run by conscripts. The project is part of a $6 billion injection from the EU into Africa as a way to curb migration from south to north, but this case shows that more oversight is needed in the process. Another immigration story centers around a steady stream of Argentinians relocating to Uruguay, a move that the latter is quite happy about. Uruguay enticed residents from its southern neighbor by lowering the minimum value of property required for tax residency from $1.7 million to $380,000 and by offering a 10-year tax holiday. That, in turn, has led close to 20,000 people to flock north this year, a number equivalent to about 0.6% of Uruguay's population of 3.5 million, meaning the great pandemic migration continues. Perhaps signaling that Bosnia-Herzegovina is next on the luxury destination list, Saudi developer Dar al Arkan announced this year it would build a 5 million square foot residential and hotel complex outside of Sarajevo, making it the largest real estate project in the country's history. This addition is being touted as a second home community that will attract both Bosnian and international visitors and expand the developer's global footprint. When much of the world was brought to a standstill, a Mongolian cuckoo made its most epic journey yet, an 8,000-mile, 13,000-kilometer return trip from South Africa to Mongolia, completing a round-trip journey that's one of the longest ever recorded for a land bird. Scientists tracked the bird using a GPS tag to study its habits, and were frankly surprised it survived the year away and 27 border crossings. Though long-distance birds aren't revelatory, the lengths to which this species went are notable and perhaps poses more questions than answers such as, why go so far? The Armenia-Azerbaijan war populated headlines this fall, but notably absent from those stories were the United States' involvement in the conflict. Prior to the Trump administration, the United States actively engaged in previous peace negotiations in the region, but the America First doctrine that dominates the current administration led to diplomatic disengagement there. That said, the two countries still agreed to a ceasefire, which has already been tested and broken, according to Russian peacekeepers, and now we'll see if the Biden administration plans to become more involved. Move over, rum. Jamaica is looking to a new economic driver. Bamboo. The government announced efforts to boost bamboo production on the island nation, which it sees as a more sustainable revenue source. Bamboo is a quick-growing plant that can be used as an alternative to traditional wood products in tissues, paper, and cloth. Caribbean island nations are, in some cases, pushing for greener futures out of necessity in 2019, Jamaica banned plastic bags and styrofoam, and also opportunity. The EU is getting a lot of attention, and this time it's because North Macedonia and Albania have restarted negotiations to join the 27-member institution. The two Balkan countries were put on hold for two years after some EU members questioned their track records regarding democracy and corruption, but those concerns have been assuaged and there's renewed momentum for the two to join neighbors Serbia, Kosovo, Montenegro, and Bosnia in entering the EU. Even with Great Britain's exit, the EU motto these days seems to be, the more the merrier. Qatar is Australia's third biggest destination for lamb exports behind the US and China, but that's likely to change with the Arab country cancelling its subsidy of meat from down under. 
The subsidies, which support this $300 million a year trade, were set to expire in 2023, but Qatar abruptly announced their end this year. Some are linking the decision to Australia's criticism of Qatar's treatment of 13 Australian women earlier this year who were questionably strip-searched at Doha International Airport. Qatar says that's not it, and rather it's to bolster their sustainability and independence. If you're one of those people who are sketched out by large bodies of water and their unknown contents, this won't provide comfort. In Lithuania, a team of divers completing a survey for bridge repairs came across the remains of a 16th century soldier, including leather boots with spurs, a leather belt with a buckle, and an iron sword. Though the current bridge was built in 1934, records indicate there was also one in its place 500 years ago. It's the first underwater remains to be found in Lithuania, and researchers were impressed by how well preserved the skeleton was. Know anyone looking for a pet elephant? Well, Namibia has 170 of them for sale. That's because, despite the mammal being on the endangered species list, they're seeing a population rebound in the South African country thanks to successful conservation measures, jumping from 7,500 in 1995 to 24,000 in 2019. But with their growth comes an increase in human-elephant conflict as well as a fight for natural resources during a drought year. Auctioning off some of the pachyderms may alleviate some of the stress and raise funds for the country. President Adama Barrow assumed leadership in the Gambia in 2017 after 22 years of brutal dictatorship, and at the time he promised to call for new elections after three years instead of serving the full five-year term. Well, guess what? Now he wants the full five. Earlier this year, protesters took to the streets to show their disappointments and, in turn, 137 of them were arrested and dozens more were detained. For some residents, the show of force seemed like a hearkening back to the country's darker days, and it looks like Barrow will be staying in power. The second largest diamond ever mined was unearthed in 2019, but it caused headlines this year for its subsequent sale. It wasn't a diamond house or British royal that bought the 1,758 carat gem, but French company Louis Vuitton that purchased it from the Caro mine in Botswana. The sale isn't only notable because of the price – no numbers have been released but some estimate around $50 million – but because the buyer is a relative newcomer to the super high-end jewelry market and this boss move signals they're here to stay. Scientists in Gabon discovered their own treasure this year, finding the largest pangolin ever on record and tagging it for research purposes. The scaly mammal is thought to be one of the most frequently illegally trafficked animals in the world, with much of the demand coming from Asia, and researchers are hoping that by learning about the creature's habits and movements, they'll be better able to protect it as demand increases for both its meat and bones, which are often used in Chinese medicine. Former Lesotho Prime Minister Thomas Thaman has denied any role in his ex-wife's murder despite police reports that say he previously paid a $20,000 down payment for her killing, which was part of a $180,000 total sum. His ex-wife was shot in a car two days before his inauguration. Before that, she rejected getting a divorce so that she could remain the First Lady. He remarried two months after her death, but was forced to resign from power amid the controversy. North Macedonia, which only became North in 2019 to differ itself from the Greek region of Macedonia, has the potential to delineate itself through marijuana production too, if the government will support it. Though medical marijuana has been legal in the country since 2016, there's a new push to legalize cannabis in all forms and to ramp up production to supply Western European countries with pot, where sale and consumption are permitted in modest amounts, but huge grow operations are not. Toward the end of 2020, government officials signaled their support to make North Macedonia a quote, cannabis superpower. Burning and removing statues has been a thing this year, and a wood depiction of Melania Trump erected in her hometown of Sejunica, Slovenia was no exception. Someone set fire to the statue in July, so the artist took the reasonable action of replacing it in more permanent bronze. That was probably a good idea, since the town of 5,000 residents has seen upwards of 20,000 Melania tourists a year since 2016, when President Trump took office. Vultures may not be the cutest birds, but they're one the animal kingdom needs for their scavenger role. Unfortunately, the hooded vulture in Guinea-Bissau inched closer to extinction this year with the accidental poisoning of more than 1,000 of the birds. There, residents put strychnine in the landfills to ward off feral dogs, with the unintended consequence of it being consumed by these scavenging birds. 
This actually happens a lot in Africa, and the vulture population across the continent is highly threatened because of it. A woman in Latvia made headlines for taking 10 days off after her child was born, because she took it as paternity leave. Previously, same-sex couples in the country had not been granted the right to both take parental leave, but she fought the ruling as unconstitutional and was the first woman in the country to use her paternity leave. Arab countries trying to get the attention of Europeans are doing it in perhaps the most obvious way ever. Through soccer. Or football, for the rest of the world. That's why Bahrain purchased a minority stake in football club Paris FC this year, with a direct goal to attract more Europeans to the Gulf state, which is still feeling the negative effects of stifling pro-democracy uprisings during the Arab Spring and is therefore trying to patch up its global reputation. We hear a lot about the migration crises of people traveling from Africa to Europe and Central America to the United States, but a movement that gets less coverage is the one of Venezuelans, many of which go to Trinidad and Tobago. By late 2020, there were almost 20,000 registered refugees in the island nation, but amid the ones who made it, there are tragic stories too. Most recently, 11 Venezuelans, including children, died in a boat trying to cross the Gulf of Paria, which separates Trinidad from the Venezuelan coast by just under 7 miles or 11 kilometers. When a constitutional referendum passed in Guinea earlier this year that allowed the president to run for a third term instead of ending at two, it was certainly created with President Alpha Conde in mind. There were protests then, and again when he was re-elected in October with nearly 60% of the vote. Since the results, dozens have died in the demonstrations, but that didn't stop him from being sworn into office earlier this month. Cyber warfare seems like something that happens in the ether, but American operatives actually traveled to Estonia prior to the American election in November to learn about the northeastern European country's sophisticated defense tactics. Specifically, the US had Russian hackers in mind, and Estonia has one of the stronger defense networks because Russia used to test its malware and disinformation campaigns there. A whistleblower from a 2004 case between Australia and East Timor continues to draw attention, and this year the lawyer for the anonymous whistleblower, referred to as Witness K, won a free speech prize for his work on the case. Witness K and lawyer Bernard Coolery revealed that Australia was spying on conversations between East Timorese officials about oil and gas negotiations in the Timor Sea. East Timor is one of the poorer countries in the world, and whistleblowing did help the country get a fairer financial deal. Mauritius is an Indian Ocean island country that sees 1.3 million visitors each year, many coming for its lagoons, tropical jungles, and mountains. But a Japanese oil tanker ran ashore in July, spilling 1,000 tons of fuel into the sea, and since then more than 40 dolphins have washed up on shore. Some are worried the disaster could extend beyond dying dolphins and severely impact the country's environment and therefore its primary tourist draw, the pristine nature. Those who are in, are in. But now that Cyprus has shut the door on its Golden Passport program, it will be harder for people to buy their way into the European Union. More than 3,000 foreigners who agreed to invest $2 million each into the country benefited from this program in its seven-year existence, but new allegations of, and no one could have guessed this, corruption have led officials to suspend the program. But that's not to say it wasn't worth it. Cyprus raised $7 billion from it, all told. Iswatini joined an exclusive club this past fall countries that have consulates to Morocco in the Western Sahara. As covered earlier, this is a disputed zone claimed both by Morocco and the Polisario Front, and many countries choose not to state a strong position on the issue. With the opening of a consulate to Morocco in the Western Saharan city of Laoun, however, the Kingdom of Iswatini is firmly positioning itself on Morocco's side, and it becomes the 15th country to open a consulate to Morocco in the area. Do you remember the chameleon that hadn't been seen for 100 years in Madagascar? There's another good story like it out of Djibouti, where a mouse-sized elephant shrew has been seen again for the first time in 50 years. The good news in this case, unlike with the chameleon, is that the shrew's habitat isn't under threat, so scientists finding 12 animals from the 1000 trap set hopefully means it won't be another 50 years until they're seen again. When it comes to sharing good news, Fiji beat out all other countries to become the first nation to congratulate President-elect Joe Biden on his victory. Fijian Prime Minister Frank Baini Marama sent out the celebratory tweet before any other heads of state, but it wasn't purely altruistic. In the tweet, he called for action on the planet's climate emergency and asked Biden to bring the United States back into the Paris Agreement. Think back to the origins of the pandemic, when the world still thought it would be confined to China. 
That's when the tiny island nation of the Comoros got some media attention for giving China 100 euros as a show of solidarity in fighting the virus. Of course, few places would be untouched, and it did hit the Comoros in late April, but ultimately, the Chinese-Comoros relationship is ongoing as the world's most populated country continues to invest in the East African island as part of its military and economic strategy. Guyana is poised to be one of the world's next big oil producers, but there are some who aren't happy about that potential. ExxonMobil found sites that could potentially deliver 8 billion barrels of oil, which could amount to more than $20 billion in revenue for one of South America's poorer countries. The World Bank has pledged $55 million to help the country in its development, but critics say this opposes global goals in curbing fossil fuel dependency. China, India, and Bhutan are in ongoing negotiations over their definitive borders. The 25th round of talks was delayed this year because of, well, you know, everything. But that didn't stop impatient Chinese from constructing and inhabiting a village one mile or 1.6 kilometers within Bhutan's recognized border this year. This territorial grab is something China continues to do, especially to its immediate neighbors such as Bhutan, which has just under 800,000 residents and poses little threat to the world and military superpower. What do China, Iran, North Korea, and the Solomon Islands all have in common? Well, as of now, it's a Facebook ban. The South Pacific nation plans to join the three countries in banning the social media site because, according to officials, citizens are using it to abuse political leaders and access dangerous information. Facebook was used as an organizing tool for protests that crippled the nation's capital last year, and critics of the ban say this is a move to stop criticism of the government. The United States military is the strongest in the world, and other countries want a piece of it. For $36 million, Montenegro was able to buy a taste—67 joint light tactical vehicles. The agreement is part of a NATO ally deal that allows such transactions between countries, and Montenegro is on the United States' friendly list as Western allies try to massage the region out of its Russian-dominated past. Looking to ease traffic congestion, Luxembourg became the first country in the world to offer public transportation entirely for free. Officials say it could save households roughly $125 per year and also encourage public transportation use versus private vehicles, which account for 71% of leisure travel and 47% of business. A new tramway in the country's capital is one attractive alternative for riders. There is an exception, though. First-class passengers will still have to pay. South America's Suriname is switching gears, with the election of a new president who replaces a dictator-turned-populist running on a poor economic record and a penchant for corruption. The new president, Chan Santoki, assumes leadership of a country on the brink of financial collapse and diplomatic disarray. In recent years, the country turned to China and Venezuela for global ties, but Santoki will be tasked in realigning the country with its former imperial power, the Netherlands. When a Japanese couple on a world tour slash honeymoon were stranded due to pandemic travel bans on the ten tiny islands off the coast of West Africa known as Cape Verde, they settled in for five months and got to know the locals. Now, they'll be ambassadors for the country at the upcoming Summer Olympics in Tokyo. Cape Verde is sending three to four athletes, and though they've never won a medal in the Summer Games, they will at least be well represented this time. Global superpowers continue to fight for strategic power on islands throughout the world, and this time, the United States has its eyes on the Maldives, where it announced it is opening an embassy. The string of 1,100 islands is also in the crosshairs of India and China, which have financially supported the nation. China has lent the country millions in infrastructure loans, which the Maldives are finding increasingly hard to pay back, and that potentially puts them in a debt trap diplomacy situation. The U.S. has promised a different approach. Our favorite nature narrator, Sir David Attenborough, gifted seven-year-old Prince George a prehistoric shark tooth that he collected while on family vacation in Malta more than 50 years ago. Malta did not appreciate the gesture. Officials said the 23-million-year-old fossil, which likely belonged to a megalodon, should rightfully find its place among their own country's cultural heritage. The Maltese eventually formally decided to let it slide this time, opting to avoid making the young prince cry. A couple of cases of beer may sound like a party in some countries, but in Brunei, for a foreigner, it meant getting questioned by police. An Indonesian national was found with 57 beers in his car at a road stop, which was a problem for him because alcohol is actually illegal in the country. There is an exception for non-Muslim foreigners who are allowed to possess up to 12 cans or 2 liters of beer, but he had four times the limit, and that's a party foul. 
It appears that fish off the coast of Belize have tamed a shrimp species in the same-ish way that humans domesticated dogs, at least according to new scientific research. Apparently, the damselfish aggressively defends a patch of algae against all predators because that's where it harvests food, but it allows mizzed shrimp to hang around. In turn, the shrimp fertilize the algae so it's better food for the damselfish. After time, the shrimp rely on the fish for protection, and that's domestication. Exploratory drilling near the Bahamas and 150 miles or 240 kilometers from the Florida coast is set to take place soon, despite opposition from environmental groups and a ban from the United States on offshore drilling. That's because the Bahamas Petroleum Company has leases on potential oil fields in the area, and they're exercising them. Some are worried about the environmental effects should something go wrong, as has been the case time and time again, but the Bahamas sees dollar signs that it needs in order to compensate for the financial hit it took when tourism ground to a halt this year. Researchers studying islanders in a less tropical part of the world found one interesting and potentially evolutionary trait. It seems that 2% of Iceland's residents can't smell foul fish. In fact, when presented with the malodorous sample, they pleasantly detected caramel, rose, or potatoes. These scientific human specimens possess a mutation that turns off their TAAR5 gene, you know, the one responsible for making a protein that recognizes trimethylamine, aka a chemical found in rotten fish and sometimes human sweat and urine. Vanuatu is a country that's been hit hard by Mother Nature, having experienced two volcanic eruptions and two Category 5 cyclones in the past five years. Disaster relief is something officials there are having to learn quickly and execute often. To do so, one system they've recently implemented is distributing emergency relief funds to residents via blockchain technology and tap-and-pay cards. The cards are loaded with money that residents can use immediately, and it avoids some of the red tape that typically consumes relief efforts. Racial reckoning sparked movements worldwide, and that groundswell did not leave the island of Barbados untouched. This most eastern island in the Caribbean formally announced it would remove Queen Elizabeth as its head of state and become a republic in 2021, citing long-simmering tensions about the legacy of colonization and racial injustice. Some see the island's decision to part with monarchy as a tipping point for neighboring countries who may also seek their own independence. To help young women in Sao Tome and Principe, the World Bank announced its commitment of $15 million to empower young girls. Providing safe learning spaces in schools is one of the immediate goals of the funding, where dropping out and pregnancy are common for girls at a young age. Concurrently, but unrelated to the funding, the country's National Olympic Committee announced a push to encourage girls aged 6 to 18 into surfing lessons, another way to steer young women into positive alternatives and potentially build their Summer Olympics team. Samoa's state-owned flag carrier Samoa Airways was reporting financial trouble at a loss of $25 million in 2019, according to reports. That was before this year and the decimation of passenger demand, and so it's not looking any better for them. The airline also reportedly owes $11 million to creditors, but of course, executives are painting a rosier picture. This all comes as Samoa Airways tries to complete its lease negotiations for a Boeing 737-800 from the Netherlands, and further debt could hinder those. When it comes to the world's top honeymoon destination, there's one place that keeps blowing every other location out of international waters, so to speak. Saint Lucia. The Caribbean island was named the number one honeymoon locale for the twelfth time and third consecutive year. The World Travel Awards were announced virtually in Moscow this year, and hopefully, by this time next year, people won't have to take a virtual honeymoon to St. Lucia. Climate change is impacting all islands, including the 32 atolls that comprise the nation of Kiribati. That's why President Tanati Maumau will accept funding from China to dredge sand along the most populous islands to actually raise them out of the sea. Some see this as a strategic play by China to inch further into the Pacific Ocean, where military presence closer to the United States would certainly be a power move. Mao Mao, however, says Kiribati would not grant China the gift of building a base on its nearby Christmas Island, which just happens to be relatively close to Hawaii. The Federated States of Micronesia are composed of more than 600 islands stretching 1,600 miles or 2,700 kilometers across the Pacific Ocean. The country's population is quite small in comparison to the vastness that gives it the 14th largest exclusive economic zone in the world. This is what makes the rescue of three stranded men who wrote SOS in the sand on a deserted atoll most impressive. 
They'd run out of fuel and drifted 118 miles or 190 kilometers west of their departure point and were spotted by a search plane three days after their departure. Another stranded island story transports us to Granada, where a British woman visiting the Caribbean island found herself stuck thanks to the spring's travel bans. The problem is that she was six months pregnant and ended up delivering her child on the island prematurely. She ended up securing a repatriation flight in June, becoming one of tens of thousands of British who were chartered back from at least 57 countries. We're getting to the smaller countries, and most of them are islands. During 2015, a 30-mile, 50-kilometer algal bloom made a slow water surface crawl into the Pacific, and scientists were baffled by what caused it until a report was released this year. The patch was created by Tonga Island runoff, rich in iron and phosphorus. This is common, but its delayed appearance is not, and that's what confused scientists. It took some time for a nitrogen fixer to utilize the nutrients, making it seem like the bloom came out of nowhere when it had actually slow-cooked its way across the ocean. Travel between Ukraine and St. Vincent and the Grenadines became easier following the signing of a visa-free travel agreement between the two countries. The Caribbean country is part of the Commonwealth of Nations, a political association of 54 members, nearly all former territories of the British Empire. Ukraine has its eyes on some of the more powerful Commonwealth members granting visa-free travel, or at least the ambassador tweeted an allusion to that, with Australia, UK, and Canada on his wish list. It's been 44 years since the Seychelles secured its independence from Britain, and this year marked the first time that a president from the opposition party won an election since the country's British breakaway. That's being heralded as a step towards greater democracy, with Wavell Ram Kalawin defeating an incumbent from the United Seychelles Party, which had been in power since 1977. British sailor and 72-year-old man Graham Walters was super social distancing when he sailed from Great Britain to Antigua, setting the record for the oldest person to cross the Atlantic Ocean solo. It was actually his fifth trip across the ocean, and he nearly went awry at the end when strong winds blew him 6 miles or 10 kilometers off course of Antigua. He was able to call the Coast Guard and get a tow to his final destination, and officials still counted it as a world record even with the assist. One of the tiniest European countries, Andorra, joined the big guns and became the 190th nation to become a part of the International Monetary Fund. But why now? Well, crisis financing mostly, which the IMF comes through on for countries in need, among other missions. Trade and tourism, mostly ski resorts and hiking trails, contribute to 40% of the mountainous country's economy, and they're hurting right now with a lack thereof. A Caribbean island that's counting on tourism and the economy bouncing back is Dominica. It announced its intentions to build a new long-haul airport, capitalizing on a growing ecotourism and offshore financial sector. Currently, visitors must transfer to Dominica through a neighboring island, but this new airport would make direct trips from the United States, United Kingdom, and Western Europe more possible. Officials say it will be largely financed by foreigners who pay in exchange for a passport, but it seems that we've heard this story before. What drifts away from the coast of Mexico likely ends up at the Marshall Islands, according to computer simulations. In this case, it was a boat full of cocaine. Without any evidence or leads, law enforcement officials have theorized that a boat filled with 1,430 pounds or 650 kilograms of the illegal drug came from the Mexican or Central American coast and had probably been floating captainless for at least a year. Though drugs have washed up on shore before, this was the largest ever haul, and it was quickly incinerated. It seems that Caribbean islands are all vying for new citizens and the influx of money they bring. St. Kitts and Nevis has made the process so easy that wealthy investors can get citizenship in under 60 days, one of the fastest tracks in the world, without even having to step foot in the country, and for that they've been recognized by the Financial Times for having one of the best citizen by investment programs. For $150,000, a family of four can call St. Kitts their second, or third, or fourth home. Sir Jim Radcliffe is another wealthy individual moving to sunnier skies. He's leaving the United Kingdom for Monaco, where he'll save up to $5.4 billion in taxes. Ratcliffe is a petrochemicals magnate with an estimated worth of $23.6 billion. People who live in Monaco for at least 183 days a year don't pay income or property taxes, and that's a lot different from the up to 45% he could be paying under the UK's tax system. Sandwiched between Austria and Switzerland, Liechtenstein said no to developing an international rail system. The country is only 15 miles or 25 kilometers long and has just one domestic track. 
This initiative would have widened it and upgraded one of the terminals so that international trains could stop there, but voters turned down the project at the polls, balking at the $73.5 million price tag. With a 6pm curfew in Italy due to lockdowns, residents looking for a little nightlife are hopping the border into San Marino, where bars and restaurants are open until 10pm. The small independent country is just 10 minutes from cities such as Rimini, and Italian officials are frustrated that by San Marino not falling in line with their own guidelines, they're putting more citizens at risk of spreading the virus. Palau, about 1,000 miles or 1,600 kilometers from the Philippines, has a free association agreement with the United States that delivers significant financial aid and gives Palauans the right to travel to, live, and work in the U.S. But that current compact expires in 2024, and Palau wants even more U.S. presence. They've invited America to build a military base on their island. Currently, Palau has no military, and they see an American base there as a way to bolster security, and for the United States, it's a way to push back against growing Chinese influence in the region. The Perth Mint in Australia produces Tuvalu's currency, including the Tuvalu dollar, which is used alongside the Australian dollar and a series of collectible coins. This year, Tuvalu issued a coin of American film star John Wayne that has been selling for more than $100. It turns out, the collectible coin business is quite lucrative for the tiny island, which receives about $200,000 a year in royalties. The coins are technically legal tender, but more so they're purchased by international collectors. Australia uses the tiny Micronesian island of Nauru as an outpost for refugees to spend time while their claims are processed. In combination with Papua New Guinea, where detainees are also kept, there are about 300 people held, but Australia spent $1.2 billion this financial year to keep them there, equally about $4 million per person. This is causing many to turn their heads at the exorbitant cost that would be better spent just keeping those refugees in Australia. On top of that, conditions in the refugee camps are poor and sometimes dangerous, so the money has not been well spent. And here we are, the world's smallest country, the Vatican City. This year it has a very 2020 story. Catholicism's headquarters may have missed the mark on the nativity scene. Each year, the holy city produces a new scene donated by an Italian city. This year, Castelli, a town known for ceramics, got the spotlight, but the curious stylings of coiled clay meat astronauts have received curious reviews. Castellians made the figures over decades, and they've survived natural disasters and more. One observer saw hope in the scene. Quote, it's a nativity scene that has had problems, like we've all had in a lousy year, she said. If it made it, we can. And that's it. That's the news you missed in 2020, or at least some of it, from every country in the world. If you've made it to this point, you're clearly a lover of learning about the world. Therefore, I'm going to recommend you an audiobook from our sponsor, Audible, that'd honestly be stunned if someone who made it through all 195 countries has not already listened to. It's Prisoners of Geography by Tim Marshall, which is this fascinating read about how geography constrains countries. It explains things like why Putin is so focused on Crimea, why Europe will never be united, and why the US was destined to become a superpower. You can actually listen to this completely for free by signing up for a free trial to Audible Premium Plus at audible.com slash Wendover. That subscription includes the traditional credit system that allows you to get any audiobook in their catalog, plus the new way to consume audio entertainment, Audible Plus. This gives you unlimited access to a massive catalog of audiobooks, Audible originals, podcasts, and more, which gives you great content that can entertain and educate you anytime your ears are free. If you're just interested in Audible Plus, which is a fantastic deal by itself, Audible has an even better deal just for the holidays. By going to audible.com slash Wendover or texting Wendover to 500-500, you can get unlimited audio entertainment with Audible Plus for $4.95 a month for six months, and you'll be supporting the channel while you're at it.